go. Hello, everyone. Uh, is this working fine? Yes. Yeah. Um, so thanks for the organizers for inviting me and also for uh, all the workshop, which has been uh, amazing so far. Um, so my presentation is in two parts. So the first part is published. Uh, so what's published in PNIS last year and was about the evolution of uh, conjugative plasmids with high transfer rates. Uh, and the second part is uh, actually saying that a lot of what we said in the first part was not really false, but was missing a whole part of the story, uh, which I'll present here. And this also has effects on the spread of AMR. Uh, so this experimental evolution study we did was um, to evolve plasmids with variable opportunity for horizontal transfer. And we did this by, uh, so passive and plasmid carrying cells, like in standard co-evolution studies. Uh, but with treatments uh, that added uh, every day a variable proportion of immigrant, what we call immigrant cells, so which don't have uh, plasmids, so which are potential hosts. Uh, and so in the absence of transfer, the plasmid uh, carrying cells would be diluted and plasmids need uh, to transfer to subsisting populations. And the expectation we had was that with high immigration, plasmids would uh, be selected to increase the rates of transfer. So we had a no immigration treatment, which is a standard treatment, and then treatments with increasing amounts of immigrant cells every day, uh, up to 99% of plasmid free cells added every day. And there was no antibiotic selection during evolution, so plasmid carrying cells could potentially go extinct. And I did this with, um, um, so with E. coli and with one plasmid, uh, so a one plasmid, which is an NKF plasmid with, um, with a very simplified map here. So it's a conjugative plasmid with different uh, AM margins, including the uh, uh, ampicillin resistant gene, which we used to uh, identify plasmid carrying cells. Um, so this is the population dynamics that we observed, um, in which, um, so, for 10 days, roughly, we had a plasmid carrying cells uh, subsisting at high levels in the populations until uh, after which time uh, there was a decrease in plasmid carrying population density as measured by ampicillin resistance, uh, especially with high immigration treatments. Uh, so but at this point, so I took uh, one clone per, um, per lineage for uh, at, at at an intermediate time point at which we could collect plasmids from each uh, population before they were extinct, and I measured their uh, conjugative transfer rates. Um, and so this is the results of uh, conjugation assays. So uh, you, can you can see on the y-axis the transfer rate of the plasmid, and the clones are ordered by immigration treatment with high immigration on the left. And the black line is the uh, transfer rate of the ancestor. So, as we had predicted, we saw uh, increased, significantly increased uh, conjugation rates for all of the high immigration treatments. So plasmid evolved higher transfer rate. Uh, and in the next step, uh, so to characterize the mechanism for this, um, I sent all of those evolved clones for sequencing, so Illumina sequencing, and uh, we mapped uh, some mutations to the sequence of the ancestor. Uh, and this is the results from the, um, a sequencing analysis. So here, so each circle is a um, is a plasmid genome uh, with no immigration treatments uh, at the um, center. So as you can see, there was very little evolution uh, mutations detected without immigrations, which which fits with the uh, phenotypic data, and most a lot of mutations uh, with immigration treatments, which are on the outside of the plot. So we saw uh, quite a few different things here. So uh, in gray, what you see is uh, large deletions. So for a few clones, we saw large deletions, which are uh, deletions of resistance, antibiotic resistance determinants. So because plasmids evolved in the absence of uh, antibiotics, they were free to, lead to, to lose antibiotic resistant genes, uh, except that we still selected clones on ampicillin, uh, to identify plasmid carrying clones in the first place. So all of the clones retained uh, the ampicillin resistant gene, which is in the middle of these deletions. And so this does suggest that there is actually more deletions going on in the population and we are biasing strongly for plasmid carry for uh, non-deleted mutants uh, at the step before, uh, yeah, to get the clones. Um, and then we saw various uh, point mutations. 
and I'll focus on two of them. So the ones on the left here in Fin O are the mutations that we basically expected to get uh, in the first place. So Fin O is the major repressor of uh, the transfer operon expression in incap plasmids. And uh, as Fernando explained uh, yesterday, um, those plasmids are usually repressed. And in the lab, we usually, we often use the repressed mutants, which are have very high transfer rates and are mutated uh, usually in Fin O. But we didn't get this many of those clones. So we only had five clones with this. And weirdly, they also didn't have very strong, um, strongly increased transfer rate. So they didn't explain much of our data. Instead, most of the uh, mutations we observed were all clustered in a small region of the copay gene, which isn't involved in transfer, but instead is involved in the regulation of replication. And to understand um, what uh, this we're doing, we didn't have to do much about with the uh, quite old uh, literature because those mutations have been very well characterized uh, in the 90s. Uh, so what COP8 does is that it's a small RNA which uh, so which uh, hybridizes to the um, mRNA of FREPE protein. And FREPE is the main, uh, is the initiator of replication and is limiting for plasmid replication and uh, plasmid copy number. And the mutations we observed were exactly the same as mutations that were observed in an important second, uh, well, uh, in one loop of the COPA RNA, and they prevent its binding and inhibition of FAPE uh, production. So those mutations are um, textbook copy number mutations. And uh, we looked at uh, if they explained transfer rate evolution. And in here, I plotted uh, across clones, the clone transfer rate on the y-axis and uh, the COP, COP A mutation status on the x-axis. Uh, and now, because we, we now have copy number of mutants, we have to look at the frequency of this mutation because not all clones have fixed uh, COP A mutation in their genome. And we saw that overall, there was a statistical uh, a significant correlation between them with COP A mutants having higher copy number. And moreover, we could say that this was causal because we had a few plasmids which had only one COPA mutation and no other mutation on the plasmid, and those had higher transfer rate. So they do increase plasmid copy, uh, plasmid copy number and plasmid copy transfer rate. And uh, so I, we did a few more experiments to understand this. And what the way we uh, think this works is that it is a gene dosage effect uh, that acts in two ways. So with higher copy number, you have both a higher number of DNA to transfer, uh, so a higher number of OETs to be recognized by uh, the um, transfer machinery. And then there is a gene dosage effect on the transfer machinery itself, so more proteins to transfer plasmids. So at this point, uh, we thought that we might also have an effect on other phenotypes because uh, the AMR genes themselves might also have a gene dosage effect. And so this has been mentioned several times uh, in the workshop as well, so it's not new. Uh, so we confirmed that indeed the clones with high copy number also have higher levels of uh, antibiotic resistance. And uh, to understand how this impacted uh, phenotypes at the population level, uh, I went back to populations that evolved for nine days in um, with or without immigration. And what we saw, and I placed those populations on normal levels and high levels of antibiotics, and I saw that um, clones um, evolved so no populations evolved without immigration, so with no selection for transfer, um, have a very low proportion of highly resistant clones, whereas populations evolved with immigration, so with selection for transfer, have a very, uh, so the majority of those populations have a high proportion of highly resistant clones. So this is what we published, and uh, so at this point we understood so this as a coupling of selection uh, because of the mutations we get are uh, plasmid copy number of mutations, the couple effectively selection for transfer and for high level antibiotic resistance. Uh, so in conditions that promote increased transfer rates, you get uh, high copy number, and this also leads to high levels of AMR. And so it also works in the opposite way. Uh, so we were quite happy with this. However, there was quite a few uh, phenotypic data that didn't totally fit with the story, so I don't have time to mention them in detail. Um, but um, some of the phenotypic data were a bit weird. Uh, and also uh, the sequencing data we had also told us that there was an additional level, um, an additional story going on. 
and uh, so this is uh, some this in additional info from the sequencing data. So what you see here is a coverage of uh, plasmid reads mapped on the plasmid uh, um, sequence. Um, and so it's relative coverage compared to the chromosome. So uh, a coverage of one means that there are as much plasmids uh, as chromosome per cell. Um, so uh, yeah, and here we have uh, ignored the two blocks. So it's different. Um, it's what happened with data cells, which were two different treatments we had. And this, but this is just to declutter the, the graph a bit. Uh, but they say basically the same here. Uh, so what you can see is that in black is the uh, is a wild type ancestor of plasmid which has a constant plasmid copy number, which is around three or four. And most of the uh, evolved clones have an increased copy number, but the thing you see directly when looking at this graph is that this isn't uniform over uh, the sequence. So there is a massive drop in coverage for a lot of the evolved clones in this region. And this region is again, uh, the, um, the, the um, antibiotic resistance region. Uh, and um, the drop corresponds to the insertion sequences which flank the resistance region. So, and so I still can't believe that uh, when I when I looked at these graphs initially, I couldn't understand what was going on for for a very long time. And and now it's in retrospect, it seems quite obvious. Uh, so what is happening here is that we have uh, within each sequence clone. Uh, there is uh, cohabiting uh, a wild type plasmid, which full length sequence, and the lesion mutants, which have lost the antibiotic resistance region. Uh, so, within a lot of the evolved clones, uh, one deletion mutants are present, and we have uh, this scenario with a full uh, resistance plasmid and deletion mutants, which are which have increased copy number, whereas in most of the cases, the wild type plasmid. Uh, full length plasmid doesn't have increased copy number. And uh, to characterize this uh, a bit in more detail, uh, so I, I had one clone which had only um, the deleted uh, plasmid, so which didn't have the high, uh, the, the full length plasmid. Uh, so it has a clean deletion. Uh, and so I just uh, did a PCR uh, using the flanking regions. And I sent this for sequencing, and from this, we from analyzing the sequence, what we saw is that this is uh, this deletion is a clean deletion of the full resistance region, uh, and uh, from the two identical uh, insertion sequences which are on the sides, there is just one left. Um, so this explained quite a lot of the weird phenotypes we saw, uh, including the fact that there is um, that the fin O mutations that we saw. Uh, had very little effect on uh, plasmid transfer rate. And this is because most of those phenol mutations uh, are on these deleted mutants. So they mostly transfer themselves and like, can detect this in conjugation assays, which rely on, um, on plating uh, on ampicillin plates. Uh, but another thing it explains is the population dynamics. So this is uh, the population dynamics data I showed initially. and. I always found them quite weird because what you see here is that for 10 days, the plasmids are transferring quite well, actually, despite the high level of immigration. Of, uh, so the, they don't mind the dilution and the transfer very efficiently. And only after 10 days do they begin to decrease. So this doesn't really fit um, with a, sip, a simple story. And now knowing that there is a evolution of deletion mutants, what I did is that uh, I took clones from uh, frozen populations at the end of the evolution experiment, uh, but that I played at this time just on LBA and not on ampicillin. And I did PCR to detect the deletion uh, junction, so to detect deletion variants. And what I saw is that uh, most of the populations are full of uh, the deletion variant. Uh, so the majority of clones uh, have this deletion variant. So what we thought was, plas well, not plasmid loss, but what we thought was plasmids not being maintained over time was actually an invasion, a progressive invasion of deletion variants uh, and the ampicillin resistant variant being displaced by those deletion variants. Um, uh, so then what I've done since then is to try to understand how those deletion variants affect population dynamics. Um, and they might have effects on both vertical and horizontal transmission of the resistant uh, variant. So first, I uh, so I 
I did an experiment where I compared just vertical transmission of different uh, setups. So in the first one, you just have the wall type a one pass need, so just being diluted over and over um, again. In the second one, I put both one deletion variant, which has low copy number, so wall type copy number, and the, wild, the full length wall type plasmid. And then in a third setup, I had the wall type plasmid coexisting with a deletion variant, which also has high copy number. And this is uh, what the dynamics of uh, the wild type copy number uh, carrying cells um, looks like. So what I saw is that the proportion of cells that with ampicillin resistance decreases over time strongly, but only for the variant which has when the deletion variant has high copy number. So there is some competition within cells and displacement of the wild type plasmid, uh, but this is not uh, this doesn't have a significant effect uh, in this experiment if the deletion mutant has a low copy number. Uh, so this suggests also that in the evolution experiment, what we saw is first evolution of high copy number, uh, and then the deletion mutants with high copy number displace the wild type plasmid. Uh, then I did um, a different experiment to look at how um, deletion mutants in uh, the recipient cell affect uh, the spread of, an, of the uh, resistant plasmid, which is in the donor cell. So I had 1% of the uh, one wild type plasmid donor that I mix with 99% of a recipient that either has no plasmid or has different variants of deletion mutants. Um, and so here you can see, uh, so I, yeah, I mix them and then I just diluted them over uh, 100 fold every day for three days. And here you see again the cell density of ampicillin resistant cells. Uh, in um, over time. So in black, you have what happens in the absence of deletion variants in the recipient. And uh, the wild type plasmid takes, takes three days to begin to significantly invade the population. So it's not really fixed at three days, but almost. Um, and for most of the, uh, when we add most of the uh, deletion variants, uh, we see that this spread is totally stopped. Uh, so this is likely due to entry exclusion. Uh, from the um, deletion variants in the recipients. So we had one of the plasmids uh, deletion variants where this wasn't working, but after looking at the chromosomal background, this is not that the plasmid is transferring to the recipients, it's just that the, um, this deletion variant is an extremely costly one. So what we see here is just a clonal spread of the donor cell, of the donor background. And finally, I did another experiment where uh, I wanted to, to look at what happens if we, if the two variants, so the wild type and the and the deletion variant, compete for transfer. So in these treatments, I had one percent of cells which contain the wild type ampicillin resistant plasmid, one percent which have either no plasmid as a control or different deletion variants, and uh, a majority uh, of recipient plasmid free cells. So here, both plasmids types begin at uh, similar frequencies and compete for access to recipients. And this worked a lot better than I thought it would be. It would, so I, I expected some effect, but not a massive effect because the first, the wild type plasmid also can transfer quite fast. But what I saw is that, so in, uh, in control treatment, the wild type plasmid invaded, uh, so began to significantly invade at three days, and then was mostly fixed by four and five days. Uh, but all of the deletion variants uh, were very good at totally stopping this spread of uh, the wild type. And this included one of the deletion variants, which has low copy number in, in orange, uh, which shouldn't have higher transfer rate. Uh, so I didn't expect it to. Uh, but actually, when I then looked at, um, I characterized colony individual colonies at three days, and uh, I saw that um, in, the, in the control treatment with just the wild type plasmid, most of the colonies are, are still plasmid free. So the wild type plasmid has just begun to invade the population. Whereas in most of the uh, deletion variant colonies, I could detect the deletion variant. So it seems to have a strong advantage, even when it doesn't have a high copy number, uh, it seems to have a strong advantage for horizontal transmission. So it's not necessarily a transfer rate because after three days, you have both transfer and selection, but it has an advantage. 
so to conclude, uh, yeah, this is a bit messy because I did this uh, five minutes ago. But uh, so the first thing uh, is that a copy number uh, is really an evolvable trait and it acts not only on vertical transmission as we've seen in many uh, talks um, this week, but it also acts on horizontal transmission, at least in this plasmid. So it's the question is open on how general this is for other conjugative plasmids. Uh, and it also acts on evolution, as we've seen in other talks. Uh, and also, so I can't prove it, but I think that here, uh, what's happening is that because we have high copy numbers, this promotes the evolution of deletion variants in the first place, because they can be combined with each other. The second thing is, uh, as has been discussed a lot in the workshop already, uh, we see the importance of non-AMR related plasmids for the dynamics of AMR. And they will act both within cells and across cells uh, to prevent transfer. And uh, this is a paper I found where uh, people looked at uh, the, they were trying to explain why some types of E. coli strains didn't have antibiotic resistance plasmids. And what the, the main factor they found wasn't CRISPR or restriction modification, but it was a plasmid of the same type without resistance genes. So acting as a barrier. And the final thing um, that I would like to say is that I think this is this type of data that I found is quite easy to miss both experimentally and in genomic data. So experimentally, it's a standard way of looking at conjugative transfer is just to play on antibiotic resistance. So we missed most of the story for a long time. And on genomic data, so I'm not an expert at all. And I, I have no idea um, how easy and how standard it is for people to look at uh, copy number uh, and also even more on the difference in coverage across a plasmid. Uh, uh, sequence. Uh, but I know that even in my case where uh, we had, I took, yeah, I could quite a lot of time to figure out what was happening even uh, in a very simple case. So yeah, I should stop here late. Yeah, I, I was planning to say exactly the same thing. How many things we miss? Like if you don't, can you hear me? Yes, I'm yeah, talking, yeah. yeah. If you don't look properly or if you just have a, hey, there is Fernando. Hello, Fernando, you are appeared. Hello, yeah, I was from the beginning, but I am yeah. in the shadows. Do you have any thing to say? I have, but I haven't risen my hand yet. So let's other, let other people talk. Let me to ask uh, questions. But nobody has a hand up. I know. Not okay, no? so then uh, I like very much your talk, very much, because you know, these things happen not to you, but to everybody. <laughs> eh? But you were uh, lucky that you found the answer, you know, because many people have things they cannot explain and you know they are there so what happens with f or, or with a1 is very interesting this kind of evolution and the loss of antibiotic resistance because it is known for a i think it's r1 that they did a, also a transcriptome analysis as the one i i uh, analyzed in r388 that i spoke uh, yesterday and they found that the only, again, that the only genes which are expressed to high, uh, um, to high level are, are the antibiotic resistances. And it is known from, from a very long time that uh, R1 can lose what was called then the R determinant. Yeah. Okay. So there are, uh, um, there are variants of R1 without resistances known from, from a very long time, because that happens even when you don't look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is interesting is you say that for evolution, this rising copy number is important. But in fact, all the F-like plasmids have very low copy number. So there must be something else which uh, impedes these variants to take over real populations. Do you know what this could be? It, 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 yeah. it can be the cost, but if the cost is mostly because of the R determinant, it is lost and then 
they will need a copy number. I think one, one problem in, not problem, one, uh, one consequence of the design of your experiment is that if you have dominant um, mutants yeah. in your variants, they will displace the wild type much more than you expect because uh, the, the low copy number won't be able to replicate at all in a strain with, uh, with the other one because the way plasmids replicate or this repe plasmids replicate is that they have to reach a concentration of the initiator to start replication. So if you have one plasmid that needs less or that is more, uh, that is more uh, the sites are more, is, if it's the copay gene, I don't remember very well, but maybe you're just shutting down replication of the other one. So you're excluding it officially from the cell and from replication. That's one thing, but there must be other things that happen as well. Uh, and you could think why these high copy number mutants never occur in nature, as far yeah. as we know. So, so I think one of it, some of it is the cost and, but the fact that I have, in this experiment, I have strong selections for, for increased transfer because, so I have one, so, all of these deletion plasmids I found that in this experiment, they all have high copy number, but I got one that has low copy number that I used in some of the experiments. Okay. So this one I was in, uh, so I had a plasmid free control population where I had 12 of them. And in one of them, I got contamination by plasmid weeds. Mm -hmm. So which got contaminated from the evolving populations. And this one has low copy number. And so in this population, after the plasmid had invaded the population, there was no more selection for transfer. So I think this one came from a high copy number one and then reverted to low copy number okay. as soon as it had no so, need to invade. So what's what your, your explanation for the absence of high copy number plasmids in, in nature of, of the R1? that overall in nature, you wouldn't have this strong, constant selection yeah, for, yeah. for transfer. Sure, yes, that's true. Maybe. Yeah, okay. We have Thank you very Olivia. much. Thank you. We have Olivia who wants to ask a question, I think. Hi, yeah, my question is really quick. Really great talk, Tatiana. I really love your work. Uh, so this is great. Um, so you did actually do the test for your the effect of your deletion variants on AMR invasion with the deleted variant of low copy number, and you saw that AMR didn't invade. Yep. Is if, I'm just trying to understand. So is your understanding similar to mine, where it's actually just that the deleted variant has um, less cost, and so it has a higher fitness, and so it's actually just clonal expansion that's making it so the deleted variant can invade faster than the plasmid that has the AMR cassette? No, so, I mean, I did a few experiments, so, and, but in none of them is very, it's not easy to know what the factor is. A lot of factors are happening in all of them, but I think what is different is that it has a, it seems to have higher horizontal transmission and once it is in a cell, then you get entry exclusion. So if it arrives in a background before the wild type does, then the wild type cannot uh, enter. And this seems to be, the effect seems to be strong enough even with low copy number. And um, so entry exclusion is just working very well in any case. Okay then. Thanks Tatiana, it was a really amazing talk. And uh, I have a piece of news on the Rowan Meta thing. So he was not here. He sent an email saying that he was double booked and he couldn't appear. And we are trying to have him speak at five or at 6.30. Uh, I will let you know, we sent him an email. Um, it's okay, I feel less bad. Um, now we have Sarah Daxbury. How do you 